Hi, this is Miles from Represent, and this is a short video demonstrating some of the features that we think make Represent API Studio stand out from the crowd. There are a few other things out there for writing RESTful APIs at the moment, but our API Studio is currently the only enterprise class design platform on the market. So, in this demo, I'm going to quickly design an API that will enable us to get some information about tax filings, including who each tax filing is for. So, what's the general process for how we go about designing an API with Studio? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import the business-oriented canonical data model or models containing the data types that we want to base the API on. Then, we're going to adapt these canonical types to meet the specific needs of the application or service in question. And finally, we're going to generate the message schemas used for the data actually transferred over the wire. Right, so how do we go about adapting the canonical data types? Well, canonical data types are adapted using something that we call realization modeling. The first step is to choose the entry point or points for the API in the canonical data graph. Make a decision about what resources we want to expose in our API. Then we're going to refactor. We're going to get the right balance between embedding data and hyperlinking between resources. Then we're going to reduce. We're going to filter out everything that we don't actually need. And then finally, we're going to constrain. We're going to add contextual constraints where these are needed. Right then, so here we are in Represent API Studio, and let's have a very quick look at the canonical data model that I've set up for this demo. It's very small, and it's not really representative of an industrial strength canonical data model that would contain an awful lot more stuff. This one's only got three main data types in it. It's got a tax filing data type, it's got a person data type, and an address data type. It's also got some enumerations down here, but we won't bother with those right now. So let's have a quick look inside the tax filing structure. Most of the properties in here are simple. They're just string types or other simple types, but we also have some complex types. We've got a reference here to a taxpayer type of type person, which is the one down here. Person, very similar, mostly strings, also has a reference to an address type and it has a reference back to a collection of tax filings. Note the cardinality indicator. Here's the address type. So it's a very simple data model for purposes of this demo. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at importing it. And let me show you the import statement and how easy that is to use. So we use code assist, get the import statement. We're going to import from canonical data taxation and then we want the stuff, the actual data model that we're going to import, and that's here. So that's how simple it is to import a canonical data model into your API model. Now note, this is a local file on the local file system. It could also equally well be imported from an HTTP URL from some distributed file system somewhere in your enterprise. Right, so let's get swiftly on with defining the API itself. Now, next thing we've got to do is we've got to choose what resources we want in the API. We've got our basic data type, so what resources do we want to put in the API to expose this data? So we have three basic choices, tax, filing, person and address. Address on its own doesn't really make sense, but let's just start in the middle and let's look at what person looks like. Now, when the diagram on the right updates, we'll see what this API is going to look like from the point of view of resources and what data is going to be accessible via those resources and how. So right here we've got a person object resource giving access to the person data which has embedded within it data for address and a collection of tax filings. Down here we see all the properties for the person type itself. Alternatively we can have a tax filing resource and when the diagram updates We'll see what that looks like. Here we have a tax filing object giving access to tax filing data, which has embedded within it person data. In turn, this has address data embedded within it, and then we see the properties down here for the tax filing itself, the other properties. But this isn't an either or kind of situation because we can have 
more than one resource in an API. So what does this look like when we do that? So that's interesting. Now what's happened is that the person data that used to be embedded here inside the tax filing data when we only had the tax filing object resource is hyperlinked over to this resource. That means that an end user of this particular resource, should it want person data for this tax filing, would have to traverse a hyperlink, do another get in order to get it. But what are the other options here? Well, first of all, let's have a look. We could, if we wanted to, even though we've got two resources now, one for each of the main data types in the API, we could we can make some choices. We can embed the data again. So we choose reference embed and then the type that we want to embed is taxpayer. Then what happens is that the diagram will update and it will go back to looking like this. Note, so we've got two resources and all of the data is embedded within each. There's no kind of dependency between the two. Now, there's one more thing we can do. We can do a kind of a hybrid between these two. So here we've got all of the data for person being embedded, but what we can do is we could just get a little bit of that data and we could still use a hyperlink and we can do this using a reference link instead. So if we convert the reference link here, we can now add some target properties so that we can do what we call decorate this hyperlink. So right here what we've got is we've got a reference link with a couple of properties embedded within it. So what's this for? So the best way of looking at this is imagine you had a kind of a table of data, an HTML table, and you needed to populate that table with some top level data about, say, the person that this tax filing was for. You just needed to put their first name and last name in it, and then there'll be a hyperlink there as well. So when the user clicked on that hyperlink, you do a get on this resource and you go get the rest of the data for that person. So this gives us a nice kind of halfway house between embedding all this data and using a hyperlink. Now in the next step I'm going to flesh out this API a little bit because we've got to remember that represent enables us to fully describe a RESTful API in all its aspects. So what I've done here is I've added some detail to both of our object resources, the one for tax filing and the one for person. And let's just step through this very quickly. So you can see that the resource itself has a relative URI, tax filings with an ID. And this ID is bound to the filing ID property inside our tax filing structure. Here's our reference link that we had before. And we also, we've got media types declared. So this one is going to be application JSON. And then we've got one get method defined on both. And the get methods take a request. And they have two possible responses at the moment. One returns a tax filing object, and that's going to look like this. And the other one is for a bad request. And we've got the same deal down here for person. So the next step is to reduce. We're going to reduce the properties exposed by the two resources to just the ones that we need using property subsets. So here I've got some I've done already and I've commented them out. And let's have a look at what we're going to do now. The choices that we've got for property subsets when it comes to reducing the number of properties are these two forms. So let's start with the first one. Now, what this says is that I want to expose all properties excluding currency and status. So if we look over here now, we'll see that currency and status have disappeared from the list. Now, alternatively, we can use this formulation where we can use with only properties where we explicitly itemize the properties that we want. Let me just uncomment that. And we'll see it has the same net effect on the model. So down here, I'm going to use the with all properties form. I'm going to say I want all the properties and I'm going to use an exclusion clause so I can get rid of just the ones that I don't want and go back up here 
I'm going to actually change this back now and I'm going to go back to this form for reasons that will become apparent in a moment. There we go. So that looks good. We've got rid of all the properties that we really don't need in this context. Now the next thing I'd like to reduce is the number of properties that we're seeing here in the address structure. Now the stuff in here that I'm really not interested in. So how would I get rid of some of those? So in the next step I've introduced an explicit reference embed here. And the explicit reference embed when I uncomment it will have no effect on the way in which our model looks. But what it does enable me to do is introduce a target properties element and to explicitly mention the target properties that I want. So let's look at how that affects the model. There we go. We've reduced the properties exposed in dress to just string, postcode, to, sorry, string, city, postcode and uh, country. Now the final modeling step is to add some contextual constraints. So here we've got is an identical model, but I've added some clauses, some including clauses to our property subsets. Note that the form, we, we can say here with all properties, and formerly we were saying just excluding these, but what we're going to do is by adding the uh, including section, we can actually play around with the contextual constraints on the properties here that we're mentioning. So I've added the including clause here so I can say that jurisdictions should always have a length of six and that the period property should always be in a value between one and four. And when I look down here, I've added a similar clause, an including clause above my exclusion. And what I'm gonna do is I'm using this to do something slightly clever for the taxpayer ID for my purposes I would like this to be a social security number so it needs to match a regular expression for a social security number and here we've got exactly that now for address I've added a cardinality override the default cardinality for addresses you can have one or not but I want there to always be at least one address for this person in fact one address there must be an address so it will be um, a violation of the schema that's eventually generated if there's a missing address now the last step here is to generate the message schema for the data actually transferred over the wire to and from the resources in this API we've just designed so how do we do that so we go up here to the uh, generate menu and we pick generate JSON schema it completes and then if we go and look here underneath the generated folder we find taxblaster.json and here we find the JSON schema which describes the messages that can pass to and from this API. The final thing I'd like to show you is a real-world example which kind of gives you more of an idea about why the features I've just shown you would be really useful. Now we just wait for this diagram to generate because the uh, data structure in this particular case is enormous. We see this. So just left in its raw state, an API that gave access to this particular kind of data would send back a whole hell of a lot of stuff. I mean, you can see it's vast. So if we were writing an API that was going to be based on this canonical data, we'd really want to be able to use the techniques and everything else that we've just seen in order to be able to whittle it down to just the stuff that we wanted and then factor it out sideways into a number of resources which is going to take the burden off consumers so they don't have too much data to deal with and they can pick the data they want as and when they need it. So. Thanks very much for watching this video. Uh, I hope you found it useful and interesting. Um, please follow us on YouTube for more feature demos and useful API design tips.